I'm Steve Schneck, the director of the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies here at Catholic University and uh, one of the hosts of this evening's event. Uh, Your Eminence Cardinal Wuerl, Chancellor of the University, Your Excellency Archbishop Vigneron, Chairman of the University's Board of Trustees, Your Excellency Archbishop Pietro Sambi, Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, Eminences, Your Excellencies, Bishops and Ambassadors, Trustees of the University, President and Mrs. Garvey, Professors, Fellows and Distinguished Guests, Welcome to the Catholic University of America. Welcome to the University's Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies Annual Hoagie Memorial Lecture and our first annual awarding of the Bishop John Joseph Keene Medallion. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Archbishop Vigneron, Chairman of the University's Board of Trustees and Archbishop of Detroit, uh, to begin the evening with an invocation. Uh, Archbishop Vigneron. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Lord God, we praise and bless your name that you have given us every good gift in the Lord Jesus. You have called us to serve the church and the nation. The great aspiration of this university, the great aspiration of so many faithful lay women and lay men who serve your people in the name of the teachings that we have from Christ. We ask that through our time together, we will be strengthened for the mission, that in all things we will devote ourselves to glorifying your name. We ask that through this food we will be strong. We ask that you bless those who have prepared it, those who serve it to us. We ask that you send help from on high to those who find themselves this night alone without friends or food. Bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me say that this year marks the 120th anniversary of the landmark papal encyclical Rerum Novarum, uh, Latin for new things. It was written by Pope Leo XIII as a guide to the church for its involvement in the modern world, a blueprint for how the church should engage itself in the flux of politics and culture, economics and society, and especially the moral challenges that the modern world poses. The Catholic University of America was founded, I liked to think, as part of that engagement. It was two years, in fact, before Rerum, uh, on March 7th, 1889, that Pope uh, Leo formally established the university. It was not to be another Catholic college. From the first, the mission here was to raise up and bring Catholic leadership um, to bear on the moral challenges facing America and the rest of the modern world. That's why the university is located here in Washington, a stone's throw from Capitol Hill. The university was to be a special place for engaging the church in what Rerum called new things. And now, 120 odd years later, that's what the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies has as its particular part of the university's mission. The fellows and the researchers of the Institute study new things. New things as they relate to public policy and as those public policies relate to the Catholic mission of the university. We look at current economic policies and wonder, for example, about their moral implications. And we assessed the dynamic changes going on in parochial education. 
We study the changing demographics of religion in America and the world and reflect on what those changes might mean for things like pastoral work, for, literature, for liturgy, for parishes, for the work of organizations like Catholic Charities and Catholic Relief Services. We work on issues that bear on the moral imperative of the dignity of the human person, on health care issues, environmental issues, justice issues, peace, housing, solidarity, and subsidiarity. We assess the changing patterns of migration and immigration and ask ourselves what these might mean for the future of America, the future of the church, and so forth. And of course, we do much more beyond that as well. It's to celebrate this work of ours that we last year inaugurated the Dean Hoagie Memorial Lecture. Dean was a longtime professor of sociology here at the Catholic University of America and was a preeminent fellow here at the Institute. Uh, Dean died a few years ago after a lifetime of extraordinary research on American Catholics. Publisher published oodles of books on the subject. We're honored that Dean's wife, Josephine, uh, is with us uh, this evening for this memorial. Josephine. We're honored and pleased this year to have Dr. Miguel uh, Diaz uh, to present the 2011 Dean Hoagie Memorial Lecture. Now, Dr. Diaz is the current U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. Prior to his appointment by President Obama, he was a professor of theology at St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict in Minnesota. He is the uh, co-editor of the book, From the Heart of Our People, Explorations of Catholic Systematic Theology, and uh, the author of On Being Human, On, the, uh, On Being Human, U.S. and Hispanic and Ranerian Perspectives. Dr. Diaz taught religious studies and theology at Barry University, the University of Dayton, and the University of Notre Dame. From 2001 to 2003, he taught and served as academic dean at St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary in Boynton Beach, Florida. He is a board member of the Catholic Theological Society of America and past president of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States. He holds a bachelor's degree from St. Thomas University and a master's degree and a PhD in theology from my alma mater, the University of Notre Dame. Uh, your eminences, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce Ambassador Miguel Diaz. Good evening. Buonasera. I'm glad I was able to make it to Washington after several attempts to leave Rome yesterday ended in failure. A canceled flight due to engine problems and a delay flight this morning that just brought me to uh, Washington a few, uh, just an hour and a half ago. I, I suppose I'm, uh, I'm glad that I'm the uh, ambassador to the Holy See and can count on some divine intervention. I want to begin this evening by recognizing the presence of Cardinal Wuerl, Cardinal McCarrick, and Cardinal O'Malley, the various archbishops and bishops, including the Archbishop of Miami, my hometown, the President of Catholic University of America, Dr. John Carby, various ambassadors, including, of course, Ambassador Milady, members of the judicial branch of government, members of the Department of State, members of the White House. I believe that Josh Dubois and Alexia Kelly are somewhere up there. 
I also want to express my deep gratitude to Dr. Uh, Stephen for inviting me to offer this memorial lecture this evening. And above all, for giving me the opportunity to celebrate with my friend, Ambassador Milady and his wife, Margaret. Sono veramente contentissimo di essere qui con voi. Vi porto i saluti della città eterna. Uh, to His Excellency, the Papal Nuncio, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And congratulations, uh, Ambassador Milady, for a well-deserved recognition. You're probably going to need uh, to look at those pictures that are in front of you at the table as I begin my remarks this evening. The hall at the Doge's Palace in Venice called Sala del Collegio contains several paintings that suggest the central role of religion in Venetian state affairs. Of particular interest is the fact that this was the hall where the Dutch received governors, bishops, and ambassadors. The ceiling, which contains three central depictions, was commissioned in 1575 from Paolo Veronese, a great painter of the Italian Renaissance. A critical analysis of Veronese's paintings and the historical context that produced them lies beyond the purpose of my present reflections. Suffice to say that Veronese created the paintings in this diplomatic room following the peace that the Republic of Venice had concluded with the Turks in 1573 and in light of ongoing tensions experienced by the Republic with the papacy in Rome. The mediating role of religion in Venetian contributions to the common good is the central motif of Veronese's paintings in this room. The first painting on the ceiling represents the state and alludes to the power of the Republic of Venice. Mars symbolizes power over land, and Neptune symbolizes power over sea. Above them, Veronese places two hovering angels, and in between them, he paints the figure of the lion, a religious symbol that represents the evangelist, Saint Mark. Veronese devotes the second painting entirely to religion and faith. Representing religion is the figure of an Old Testament priest. Representing faith is a woman dressed in white who carries a chalice and sits suspended on a majestic cloud. An inscription in Latin which accompanies this image warns the state against abandoning religion as its foundation. Nunquam derelicta republicae fundamentum. The third of these paintings on the ceiling contains two women. Justice carries a sword and scale, while peace carries olive branches. They stand at the feet of Venice, who holds a scepter and sits on an orb that resembles the world. Veronese depicts the winged lion in between these figures, once again pointing to the role of religion in the state's efforts to achieve justice and peace. Other depictions surround this central paintings that suggest virtuous acts necessary for the common good. Of particular interest are the paintings that highlight the eight virtues 
and those that recall various outstanding deeds of ancient heroes. Baroness's paintings at the Doge's Palace in Venice provide a fitting way to introduce the theme of my reflections tonight. Building bridges, religion diplomacy, and the pursuit of the common good. Venice has been characterized as the city of bridges. This characterization is appropriate not only because of the fact that numerous bridges connect Venice's 100 islands, but also because the city has a rich history of bridge building efforts within and outside of the Christian world. Indeed, the Venetian Republic cultivated a web of diplomatic relations that at one point extended far into the Eastern Roman Empire and included Christian interactions with Jewish as well as Muslim communities. Diplomatic calls today may not contain the kind of explicit religious and mythological imagery found in places like the Doge's Palace in Venice. But there is no doubt that religious ideas and actors remain indispensable tools in the pursuit of peace and justice and the good that must be commonly constructed. As Secretary Clinton has said, quote, we need to build new partnerships across regions and religions, and that requires religious leaders and NGOs, citizens to help build the good governance and transparent institutions and basic services upon which true security depends, end of quote. In what follows, I will explore briefly the subject of why diplomacy needs religion and why religion needs diplomacy in human efforts to pursue the common good. First, why diplomacy needs religion in the pursuit of the common good. It does not take much effort to witness firsthand what some observers have characterized as the globalization of God and, religious, and religion's growing influence in the international politics. In a recently published article that highlights this historical reality and its implications relative to foreign affairs, Scott M. Thomas argues that as, quote, the world becomes more religious, religion will also likely alter relations in the traditional nation-state system, end of quote. He concludes that, quote, a new kind of world is in the making, and that understanding this world is essential for U.S. and international foreign policy makers in the coming decades. Thomas argues that the United States will increase its capacity to its capacity to harness its power to improve international security and better the lives of millions if it recognizes and utilizes this worldwide religious resurgence. Thomas warns that failure to engage religion in constructive ways will lead to the negative consequences of increased violence and instability worldwide. By engaging religious communities, U.S. diplomats will expand our exercise of smart power, receiving from these communities important conceptual contributions and best practices that can address some of the challenges that confront our world. Diplomacy can constructively engage religion by embracing right and reasonable speech with respect to the nature of the common good. 
Such speech is necessary as communities throughout the world seek ways to reconcile their increasing sense of diversity and interdependence. In many ways, our world faces a very ancient question related to human identity. How can the one and the many be reconciled? The common good offers a way to affirm unity within a social body, even while maintaining the need for particularity, diversity, and above all, interdependence. Jacques Maritain, Catholic philosopher and former French ambassador to the Holy See, argued that the common good includes not only the collection of public commodities and services, but also, quote, the sum of or sociological integration of all the civic conscience, political virtues, and sense of right and liberty in the individual lives of its members, end of quote. Maritain's writings remind us that the common good is not only a system of advantages and utilities, but also a rectitude of life, an end good in itself, or as the ancients expressed it, a bonum honestum. The common good cannot be built upon deception, neglect, manipulation, or the exploitation of any person or community. Representing neither an individualistic nor collectivistic vision of society, the common good affirms oneness out of many, a pluribus unum, and the empowerment of and care for particular persons and communities, especially those most in need and lacking a voice in society. This concept of the common good provides a signpost that can guide diplomatic conversations as nations and international organizations ponder policies to meet the social, cultural, and political challenges of our time. Diplomacy not only benefits from right speech about the nature of the common good, but more specifically from right actions that advance the common good. In the pursuit of right actions, the engagement of religious leaders is indispensable. The presence of religious agents and organizations and their network of relationships are key to meet the challenges that confront us in an age marked by interdependence. Recognizing this age of interconnection, President Obama's national security strategy affirms the need to pursue comprehensive engagement. The report underscores that, quote, we must take advantage of the unparalleled connections that America's government, private sector, and citizens have around the globe. Thus, the report continues, quote, we must engage nations, institutions, and peoples around the world on the basis of mutual interests and mutual respect." End of quote. Engagement with religious leaders lies at the heart of the U.S. mission to the Holy See. The Catholic Church has a vast network of humanitarian, educational, and healthcare institutions. Moreover, Few sovereign states offer the kind of religious connections the Holy See offers. Many visitors to our embassy in Rome are surprised when they hear that at present the Holy See is among the top five states in the world in the number of countries with which it has diplomatic relations. The Holy See has diplomatic relations with 178 states. In addition, it is a member or observer in every major international organization in the world. Our mission at the Holy See has always taken advantage of this unparalleled religious connection 
and has cooperated with the Holy See on the basis of shared foreign policy interests. Since my arrival at Post, our mission has hosted two international conferences. In the first of these conferences, we partner with Caritas Internationalis to promote the care of children with HIV AIDS. In October of last year, we brought together an impressive group of leaders from Jewish, Christian, and Muslim communities to share success stories and strategies related to their common actions on economic development, conflict resolution, and environmental protection. This coming May, our mission to the Holy See will partner with St. Thomas University in Miami to host an international conference on creating private and public partnerships to prevent trafficking in persons. This TIP conference will build upon the work of my predecessors and expand the network of religious agents engaged in this important initiative. Conversations are at our mission with numerous religious leaders and organizations have moved us beyond the sharing of right words into the sphere of right human actions. At the invitation of President Obama's Cairo speech, our mission to the Holy See continues to, quote, turn dialogue into interfaith service so bridges between peoples lead to action, end of quote. Why religion needs diplomacy in the pursuit of the common good? The Second Vatican Council's pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, opens with a breath of fresh air. Quote, the joy and hope the grief and anguish of the men of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted in any way, are the joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ as well." End of quote. This important document affirms that the church has been called at all times to read the signs of the time and must be aware, understand, and speak to the upheavals and products of human thinking and creativity. While noting the role of the church as educator, Gaudium Espes also understands the church as a student of humanity, proclaiming that, quote, whatever truth, goodness, and justice is to be found in the past or present human institutions is to be held high by the Council. The Council maintains that it is not enough for religious leaders to give to the world, but also for them to receive from the world. Thus, the Council declares, quote, just as it is in the world's interest to acknowledge the church as a social reality and a driving force in history, so too the church is not unaware how much it has profited from the history and development of mankind." End of quote. There is no doubt that this conciliar understanding can be extended, mutatis mutandis, to how religion can profit from the art of diplomacy. Religion needs diplomacy to stay in touch with the social, political, and cultural realities of the world. Religion does not exist in a vacuum. Religion is a social experience that binds people together within particular cultural contexts and ties them communally to God. With respect to its human dimension, diplomats can offer religious leaders critical insights into how different governments interpret the signs of the time. Cultivating this relationship 
can prevent religious institutions from falling into sectarianism while also improving their likelihood of success with respect to actions on behalf of the common good. Simply put, Jerusalem needs Athens to become a more persuasive voice and agent of change in the world. Religion needs diplomacy to avoid fundamentalism and extremism. Religious leaders often speak in transcendental terms and proclaim absolute truths. Diplomats address ongoing worldly challenges and practice the art of compromise and negotiation. Recent events in various parts of the world have demonstrated the danger of the radicalization of religion. Without cultivating a diplomatic disposition towards openness and conversation, without a willingness to engage other points of view and discover truth and goodness in these points of view, religion runs the risk of becoming an instrument of violence. Religion can learn from diplomacy how to engage human differences and pursue reasoned conversations for the sake of advancing the common good. Concluding remarks. Catholic tradition has long conjugated faith with reason, nature with grace, and the earthly city with the city of God a position strongly supported by Pope Benedict XVI. This Chalcedonian grammar of distinguishing but never separating human life from God's life offers a way of relating diplomacy and religion. This analogy can help if on the one hand, we understand diplomats as representatives of particular human experiences, cultures, and social political histories. And, on the other hand, we take religious leaders as representatives of transcendental experiences that bind humans to God. The integration of diplomacy and religion distinguishes but does not separate their contributions to the common good. One of the titles of the Holy Father is Pontifex Maximus, the greatest of bridge builders. In antiquity, pontifexes were persons who bridged the gap between the world of humans and the world of the gods. Given the increased importance of religion in society and its value as a tool to advance the common good, gaps must be bridged between highly secularized states and religious institutions, between the foreign policies of nations that minimize engaging religion and those that maximize this engagement in fundamentalist terms, and between diplomatic activity and religious agency. If we succeed in bridging these gaps, a rapidly changing and restless world will wake up to a better tomorrow. In turn, new artists might be inspired to depict within our diplomatic halls our virtuous and outstanding deeds that have advanced the common good. Above all, these halls will become places that witness anew justice and peace facing one another at the feet of our nation's rulers. Thank you. May God bless the Catholic University of America. May God bless our diplomatic mission to the Holy See. And may God bless the United States of America. Ambassador Diaz, thank you so much for those uh, inspiring and poignant remarks. I'm sure 
had a couple of thoughts, actually. It's, um, I probably should have noticed this before, but there are um, two uh, other, two former ambassadors to the Holy See with us uh, this evening. Of course, uh, we're, we're all familiar with, with uh, Ambassador Milady, who will be receiving the Bishop Keene Award in a few minutes. But I also noticed that uh, Ambassador James Nicholson is also with us this evening, uh, also a <laughs> former ambassador to the Holy See. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I think it would be really interesting to get the three of them in a room kind of quietly and be a fly on the wall to hear their discussions of these things. As I mentioned previously, the university's founding coincides with Pope Leo XIII's efforts to involve the church in the modern world. <clears throat> that founding, by the way, fell on the shoulders of one individual very much, and that individual was Bishop John Joseph Keene, um, Bishop of Richmond, by the way. He was the first rector, what we'd say today, president, the first president of the university. It's in the spirit of that endeavor that the Institute has inaugurated a yearly award in Bishop Keene's name, the Keene Medallion. And uh, maybe you can, those of you who have wandered around can see this uh, here on the front. Uh, the medallion celebrates the role of the Institute's mission in light of the vision behind the founding of the university itself. Emblazoned on the medallion, and I know you guys can't read it all the way in the back, <laughs> But emblazoned on the medallion, oh, and I should say, too, this medallion was crafted by a professor in the Department of Art here, a fellow by the name of Stephen Jones. Um, did a wonderful job, and he's going to continue to do, us, uh, do these for us every year. But anyway, I was about to say, emblazoned on the medallion in Latin are the words academia, patria, ecclesia. This medallion is to be given now each year to honor extraordinary lifetime service to the academy, to the nation, and to the church. This year inaugurates uh, the award, and I am, and tremendously doesn't even come close to it, I am extraordinarily honored to say that the inaugural recipient of the Bishop Keen Medallion is my friend, the Honorable Thomas P. Milady. <laughs> Ambassador Milady has had a career in three fields, in diplomacy, as uh, I think that you've all realized, in higher education and in public affairs, uh, what we were just talking about. He served in four diplomatic posts. He was U.S. Ambassador to Burundi, U.S. Ambassador to Uganda, Senior Advisor to the U.S. Delegation to the United Nations, and of course, U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. His experience in higher education is also extraordinary. President of Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, also Assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for the post of secondary education uh, under Ronald Reagan uh, in his first term. Tom is also the author of 17 books and numerous articles. In fact, he has a book just coming out this week, isn't it? 29 universities have conferred honorary doctorates on Dr. Milady. Five foreign states and the Holy See have awarded him uh, their high honors. Ambassador Milady is a knight in obedience of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta and vice delegate in the United States for the Sacred Military Constantinian Order of St. George. He has also served on the National Board of Directors for the National Conference of Christians and Jews and the International League for Human Rights. He received his BA degree from Duquesne University and his MA and his PhD from here, from the Catholic University of America, back from my department. Dr. Milady is now professor and senior diplomat in residence at the Institute of World Politics here in Washington, D.C., a number of whose fellows are with us this evening, and serves on the board and committees of several uh, nonprofit organizations. And at this time, I'd like to invite to join us here, um, <clears throat> I'd like to invite uh, the president of the Catholic University of America, Mr. John Garvey, 
uh, to join us um, and to present uh, Ambassador Milady with uh, Bishop Keen Medai. It certainly is great to be here, my alma mater. I came here as a student in 1950, and it's full of pleasant memories. This is a new memory. The remnants Connell Whirl, remnants Connell McCarrick, Connell O'Malley, <laughs> thank you, and Dr. Gavi, president of the university, and Professor Sneck, director of the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies. You know what a beautiful moment it is for my wife, Margaret, who's here, to come back here and to be associated with the great memory of Bishop John J. Keene, the first president of this university. Now, Bishop Keene, our founding president, was a great advocate of placing the university here in Washington. And looking at the research, it was only natural that several cities that had well-established Catholic communities, uh, Boston, certainly, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, and there perhaps were several more, they thought perhaps the Catholic university should be there. But it wasn't a one-man decision discussed by the bishops of that era, and they selected Washington, D.C., where also in this public square we have located the executive, the Congress, and the Supreme Court. The bishop at that time, Father Keene, played a major role. He wanted engagement. It should be noted that at the time, uh, it was not a good moment for Catholic institutions. From a standpoint of power and influence, I checked the census of 1900. 1900, which is about two decades, not quite two decades after the founding of the university. In the census of 1900, for the males, men, who indicated uh, that they were Catholic, the predominant column of description was mill worker, laborer, or one-man business. My Irish grandfather and my French Canadian grandfather had similar classifications in the census of 1900. The Catholic community was in the early days of the university, therefore not a power institution. And we can look at others, whether essential constituents had power and influence. This was not true in that period of 1900. But there has been a change since then, a dramatic example of the benefits of engagement, which must have been in the minds of Father Keene, was in the 1930s. Some unpleasant memories after the Great Depression, 25 to 30 percent uh, unemployment. There was a rather unknown member of the faculty, Monsignor Ryan, and he was writing about the Catholic social principles and the obligation to think about the mass poverty, the obligation to think about what should be done. Perhaps something could be, a network could be established. From that came social security. From that came unemployment compensation. That was an engagement. It was during the administration, a very strong personality, President Roosevelt. There was an engagement about 45 years later, because we're right here in Washington, and it was, was another rather strong executive personality, and that was Ronald Reagan. When the question came up, shouldn't there be some kind of formal relationship between the Holy See, the government of the Catholic Church, and the United States? 
It had been discussed. Several attempts have been made. They didn't quite work out. Several compromises. The role of a personal envoy. But then we established it. And as good as already noted to have here, three of us who have had the honor of serving the position served past tense for two of us. And Dr. Diaz, who is here with us now. We're now in the 124th year of the university and the 235th year of the Republic. And you know, we have some refreshed leadership from time to time. Our Chancellor, Cardinal Whirl, has recently joined the Cardinal of Cardinals. And how much dignity he adds to us in his role as Chancellor and his special responsibilities for us at the university. And only recently, our lay president was inaugurated, Dr. John Garvey. And now, as we look at the map, we know that the Catholic figure has climbed close to 25%, and that, of course, tells us one thing, as opposed to 8%, 9%, and so forth. But it also indicates that we are stronger and more influential. We are, and I say quietly, leaders in the academy, government, and service to the church. We have to remain concerned. There are several matters for us. We still have a rather high degree of poverty for this very affluent state. And we must face the fact that in certain issues, while we're in the public square, there are varying opinions on these issues. Our obligations who benefit from this great university is to advocate in a clear and precise way what we believe and to maintain that at a very high level of civility. We've had several illustrations of that. And recently in the past 10 years, the late Holy Father visited the President of the United States, President Bush, and they had a discussion on various issues. And we understand there was certainly agreement on various things and other points of view. More recently, our current president, President Obama, made a visit to the Holy Father. We know there were several points of view. They set the standard for us. Open and frank discussion, faithful to our points of view, and done with civility. We can be thankful to then Father John Keane. He placed the university here in the public square. And I think we all intend to carry out these responsibilities in terms of what we should advocate and how we do it. You know, it's a great privilege for me to receive as we want to be back here, this building and many others. <laughs> didn't exist when I arrived on the campus in 1950. But thanks to the leadership, including Archbishop Vigneron, our chairman of the board, the university has grown in many ways, just not buildings. And so I say thank you very much for this award. And I close with a prayer that the Father of us all will bless this great university. Thank you. I just want to add a few words of thanks before you settle down to your dessert. It's um, 27 years since the United States established diplomatic relations with the Vatican, and our distinguished guests tonight span nearly that entire period. Mr. Milady was our third ambassador, uh, and Mr. Diaz is the latest, and Ambassador Nicholson was uh, the bridge between them. At any other university, I think without a school of foreign service, it might seem a little odd, perhaps, to celebrate two actors, however distinguished, for their service in the diplomatic corps. But here, I think it's natural for two reasons. One is, Mr. Smolady and Diaz are ambassadors to the Holy See, and we are a pontifical university. So, as the Catholic University of America, we have a foot in each of the two camps they connect. Uh, as Ambassador Diaz said. Second, 
The United States has a proud tradition, like the French, of appointing distinguished academics to serve as its ambassadors to the Holy See, distinguished academics and other people. Ambassador Diaz was not, like some ambassadors, a big contributor to President Obama's campaign, but a theology professor at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University and an authority on Karl Rahner. His predecessor, Marianne Glendon, a former member of our Board of Trustees, is the learned hand, learned hand professor of law at Harvard. And Ambassador Milady was the president of Sacred Heart University and an authority on Afro-Asian and Central European affairs and the author of 17 books, as you've just heard. And though we don't have a school of foreign service, we are home to the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies, an organization that's engaged in the analysis of public policy issues related to Catholic social thought. So many of the, the um, Policy Research Institute's fellows are with us tonight, and they and the members of our Board of Trustees join me in thanking Ambassador Diaz for his unusually thoughtful remarks and in congratulating Mr. Milady for the honor he receives tonight. This isn't the end of the dinner. We'll have a benediction at the, at the close, and uh, you can enjoy your uh, dessert secure in the knowledge that there won't be any more speech making. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I'd like to uh, take a few moments to uh, make a few quick thank yous and then invite uh, Cardinal World to bring this evening's uh, event to a close with his benediction. I'd especially like to, to thank Mr. Frank Persico, Vice President uh, for University Relations for his uh, hospitality this evening. and. Um, Suzanne McCarthy, Assistant Vice President for University Relations. And I'd like to thank as well, bear with me folks, I'd like to thank as well uh, Ms. Winchette Nagash, my office manager and assistant to the director uh, for the institute, and all of the students and graduate students and so forth that helped us put this together. And at this time, I'd like to invite uh, His Eminence Cardinal Whirl uh, to bring things to a close. Steve, thank you very much. And as we conclude, as we conclude this wonderful evening with a prayer, I think we have so many reasons to be grateful and proud. We can be proud, as we just learned this evening, of the three ambassadors who have represented our country to the Holy See. Ambassador Diaz, who just gave us a splendid presentation, worthy of the man he quoted, Jacques Maritain. Ambassador Milady, whose remark summed up for us what this whole mission has been about for so many years. And Ambassador Nicholson, who not only represented us to the Holy See, but wrote a splendid history of that relationship. As we conclude this evening, let us pray. Good and gracious God, we return you thanks this evening for the abundant blessings you have showered on all of us gathered here. As we conclude this dinner, for the Catholic University of America Board of Trustees and the Institute of policy, research, and Catholic studies. We ask you to keep us always strong in our faith, fervent in our commitment to truth, and to the excellence reflected in Catholic higher education. We ask your blessing in a very special way on Ambassador Milady, who was honored this evening. We ask your blessing as well on Ambassador Diaz, who delivered an inspiring lecture, and on all who teach and lead at this great Catholic institution of higher learning. And finally, we thank you for the time you have provided us, the opportunity to be together in your name and under the auspices of a university that claims you to be its very light. And all of this we pray through your holy name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>